So without further ado, I want to introduce my colleague who's our chief architect for today's scientific workshop, if I may say, if I may use the terminology, um, is Dr. Vincent Reynolds. So Dr. Reynolds is a toxicologist with over three decades of experience in the chemical and pharmaceutical industry. As a toxicologist, he was the study director with roles in genetic toxicology, repeat dose mammalian toxicology, and risk assessment to support workplace exposure guidelines and environmental remediation. Within the pharmaceutical industry, he has been responsible for the design, conduct, and oversight of toxicology and safety pharmacology studies, supporting regulatory filings and clinical development for numerous molecules, biologic, and siRNA drug candidates intended for the treatment of cancer, metabolic diseases, and other indications. Dr. Reynolds has been an active firefighter, so he has several jobs, and this goes back to my theme yesterday that nobody really retires and they keep working. That's my, that's my, that's my theme that I'm learning. Dr. Reynolds has been an active in the fire service since 1973 as a firefighter EMT, an engine, uh, an engine chauffeur, a lado chauffeur, a tillerman, which is hard to do, doing the tiller, and a field instructor. He holds certifications as an EMT, emergency vehicle operator, firefighter one, two, fire instructor one, two, three, fire officer one, and safety officer. Please help me in joining me here on the stage, Dr. Vince Reynolds. Thank you so much, Alberto. Uh, in an academic setting, everybody would be calling me Dr. Reynolds, but uh, I've been a fireman for a long time, and in the firehouse, I'm just Vinny. So you can just call me Vinny. The title of my talk here is Leveraging a Fundamental Toxicology Framework to Attack a Complex Problem. And what we're going to be doing today is telling a story. And I put up here two pictures to remind me and, and my speakers, my co-speakers, but especially me, that we're really speaking to two audiences today. We have firefighters in the room, and we have uh, scientists in the room. And some of my remarks and comments are going to lean a little bit more towards the fire service. Uh, attendees, and others are going to lean towards the scientists, but I hope everyone understands the complete message. If you don't understand it, it's not your fault. It's my fault for not making it understandable. So um, um, we'll have hopefully the opportunity for some questions. The story we're going to tell has a beginning. It has a middle. It will not come to an end today. We will be thinking about writing the next chapter when we come back after lunch. I'll start with the beginning talking about size up, uh, then the middle presentations. We're going to focus on doses or exposures and responses. You can tell I'm a toxicologist, dose response. And then, as I said, we'll come back after lunch um, and talk about where we go from here. Size up is something that is um, very familiar to members of the fire service. Um, we do it pretty much all the time. This is a fire here that I'm, I'm showing that occurred in Houston, Texas back in 2016. Um, the fire department, when they arrived on this incident, they were confronted with a very complicated problem. There were a lot of very fast moving variables. Um, and so how do you size something like this up? Well, you stick to basics. Um, either Slicers RS or Recio VS or whatever the acronym is that your department uses, um, and, and, and you go from there. So the, the, the first arriving companies here to size this up, they would say that they were on location of a five-story occupied multiple dwelling with fire out the windows, multiple windows on the first floor with a heavy smoke condition throughout. The exposures, one was a street, two I think was an alley, three was unknown, and four was a street. Then they initiate their action plan. The engines are stretching a line, the ladder companies are forcing entry, they're opening up, uh, commencing primary searches. And then they would adjust their action plan as additional information became available. We do this all the time. Very complicated problems. 
And in toxicology, we do the same thing. We have a way to size up a toxicology problem. We touched on this last year in our meeting. Um, so chemical carcinogenesis is really a toxicology problem. I illustrate here in this, um, this picture, this is a intestinal, a section of intestine, and there's an, a chemical that has interacted with the cells here to elicit a change. And that change progresses on over time, eventually becoming a malignant invasive tumor. Okay, so we have a, a chemical, it interacts with the living system uh, and, and elicits an adverse uh, outcome. That's fundamentally what toxicology is. So chemical carcinogenesis is at its core a toxicology problem. And we can use this framework here to try to, to, to attack the problem. So the four-step paradigm that the National Research Council uh, came out with, sorry, um, starts with hazard identification, which is a very simple yes-no question. Can the chemical cause an adverse effect? Yes or no? Not will it, can it? Then there's an exposure assessment step. How much of the chemical gets on us? How much gets in us? There's a dose response. How much of the chemical does it take to elicit an adverse outcome? And then all of that is put together into this step risk characterization where we look at the, um, the nature, the magnitude, the probabilities, the data gaps, and the uncertainties for risks in humans, okay? This information then is communicated to the shot callers, the risk managers who make policy and decide how to mitigate the risks, how to manage the risks. The focus of today's presentation is gonna be mainly on exposure assessment and looking at the response portion of the dose response assessment. And from that, we can identify areas where we can improve our risk characterization. But primarily, we're gonna be looking here. And as we go through the talks, this is more for the fire service attendees, think about how these talks fit into this framework. And, and it'll give you the, the perspective you need to understand where we are in attacking this problem. Now there are two fundamental concepts, this is more for the fire service guys, um, that you really need to understand when thinking about toxicology issues. Uh, the, the first of these is um, the dose response uh, and the, the second is kinetics. But on this slide we have dose response and just to, to s set a definition here, Dose and response are terms that are oftentimes used interchangeably. There's a little bit of slippage here in our, in our definitions. But in fact, dose is the amount which is administered or applied. Response or, or exposure is the amount which is absorbed. Okay, so there is a difference but Oftentimes, the terms are used interchangeably. Now, I illustrate here one of the fundamental principles of toxicology, that is the dose-response curve. So we have dose across the bottom, so starting from left and moving to the right, doses would increase, and responses um, are on the y-axis, responses increase as you go from bottom to top. So if we start here and start administering a dose of something that's toxic, we go along, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens, we get to a threshold, we begin then to, to elicit an adverse outcome or an adverse response which increases in magnitude as the dose continues to increase, and finally we max out that response, okay? 
this dose here, the NOAEL, the no observed adverse effect level, is the highest dose or exposure that will not provoke an adverse change. Okay, so that's a dose response curve. Many years ago, I worked with a very smart toxicologist, much smarter than I am, and he told me very firmly, if we don't understand the kinetics, then we don't understand the toxicology. And I've learned over and over since he told me that how true that is. What are we talking about with kinetics? The key kinetic variables that we have to understand if we want to understand toxicology are listed here. Absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. So absorption is the route that the material gets on us or in us, dermal, inhalation, oral, how much of it gets in. Distribution, where does it go once it gets in? Is it distributed through the blood, through the plasma? Is there protein binding? Does it deposit in tissues and build up in tissues? Metabolism, what happens to that chemical after it gets in, it undergoes chemical changes often. Um, what are those changes and what do they mean? In some cases, the changes can make the chemical more toxic, in some cases less. And then finally, um, how do we get rid of it? Um, what, are the ex what is the extent and route of excretion? Is it fecal, urine, expired air? Does it come out in the mother's milk? You know, how, how do we get rid of it? So to illustrate some of these principles, this is, the, this is the second and last graph that I'll make you guys learn. Um, this is a concentration time curve. So on the x-axis is time. On the y-axis is the plasma concentration of the drug. So at time zero, um, the individual is dosed. So in our with our problem that we deal with today. This is the time that the firefighter um, gets all covered up with smoke and soot or um, is exposed to a, a, an unknown chemical at a hazmat incident or whatever. So this is the moment of exposure. So he's got this stuff on him. It's gonna be absorbed. As it's absorbed, the plasma concentration or the blood concentration rises. Finally, he's absorbed all of it that he's going to um, he reaches the maximum concentration that is going to occur with that dose. That's C max. That occurs at a time called T max. And then metabolism and excretion begin to occur, and the blood levels will fall, and there'll be this elimination phase. Now, why am I taking time to go through this? It seems a little bit tedious, perhaps. Well, imagine. Um, we had a policy um, in a department where when you come back after a fire, you're supposed to shower within the hour, right? It sounds good. I mean, it rhymes, right? Uh, but if, if one hour on this diagram is, say, right here, all right, and for the chemical that the individual was exposed to, T max was back here, showering within the hour. You know, it, it's a swing and a miss in baseball uh, terminology. You know, it we missed. Or a second scenario, let's say we have a female firefighter who has had a baby, and she's nursing her baby. And she she wants advice. You know. How long after she goes off shift should she refrain from nursing? Oh, well, when you get off shift and you go home, don't nurse for 24 hours, okay? And let's say on this diagram, 24 hours is like right about here, okay? So she gets off shift. Um, maybe she got into something went on that shift when she was working. 24 hours is up, it's okay for her to begin nursing. Some of these elimination phases can be very, very prolonged. 
I worked with a drug one time. We dosed it for two weeks, and we had to wait five months for it to wash out. Okay, so s these elimination phases can be very prolonged. And if we come up with a policy that says refrain from nursing, you know, for 24 hours after you go off shift, we haven't taken the kinetics into account. Do you understand what I mean when I say if we don't understand the kinetics, then we don't understand the toxicology. We can't characterize the risks and the risk management decisions may miss the mark. Does everyone get what I'm saying? Okay. We're gonna have three talks following me which are gonna focus on exposure. Um, and basically the, the principle that we're gonna be trying to advance is as we think about decon, we're trying to push our exposures from right to left and back ourselves down this dose response curve so that the magnitude of the adverse changes can be sort of tamped down. So there'll be three speakers focusing on exposure issues. They will be followed by um, three talks on response. Now, a word about carcinogenic responses. Carcinogenicity is not a light switch. It, it doesn't just come on like, boom, it's there. It requires years to decades. And I'm gonna go out on a limb and suggest that you might see this diagram again later today, um, but I'll, I'll walk you through it now. Here are normal cells on the left. They receive DNA damage, so they change color here. These are damaged cells. Mutations ensue, that's uh, another color change. And then over time, there are additional changes, either additional mutations or additional epigenetic changes, which occur and continue to push um, from left to right. In many cases, these damaged cells stop and they don't go anywhere. And we will die with them. We will die with them, but we will not die because of them. It just but a few of them will progress on, ultimately resulting in malignant invasive cancer and metastasis. Now, this, this concept of, of a progressive growth should not be alien to firefighters because I show down here in the corner um, a picture we all saw back when we were in proby school. This is the, the growth of a fire in a compartment. So there's ignition, there's kind of an incipient stage, a rapid growth, a free burning phase, right? The development of cancer is very similar. We have ignition, it smolders for a while, sometimes it goes out, but then um, if it goes long enough, it's fire out the windows and fire through the roof. There's a, this, this amount of time, it's years to decades. It gives us an opportunity to come in and try to exploit some new and emerging technologies to get early diagnosis. And that's what the speakers are gonna be talking about uh, when we come back after break. The early diagnosis is akin to a smoke detector. So if we can detect the problem, I mean, oftentimes a patient will present to their physician at this point here. They have a lump or a bump, and, and it's too late. It's stage four colon cancer or whatever it is. If the problem could have been identified earlier, perhaps there could have been some interventions which would have resulted in improved clinical outcomes. Okay, so it's like a smoke detector. So which would you rather have? You know, fire on a stovetop, which activates a smoke detector and the problem is confined to the stovetop, or would you rather not have a smoke detector and nobody knows about a problem till it's fire out the windows? Okay, so the, the talks after break will be looking at um, what we can do with early detection to push the, res the magnitude of the response from top to bottom. Okay, so the 
the exposure people will be talking about going from left to right. The response people will be talking about going from top to bottom. We come back after lunch. We will write the next chapter in our story. I mean, I think we have to, to congratulate ourselves to some extent for on where we are. We have a substantial body of hazard ID data. There's really some nice work that's been published. The decon policies are beginning to get genuine traction in the fire service, which they did not used to have. I mean, when I started, um, I can remember coming back and deconning, you know, after bloody auto accidents, just washing my coat off with a, with a garden hose, and, and that was it. But the decon policies now are much more comprehensive. The cancer registry is going to be a good thing. Where do we want to be? We want our risk characterization to be improved to the point where our policies for risk management are more effective than what they are today. So we want to, to drive policy improvements. We also want to be able to have data sets that are robust enough to influence the payers, the insurance companies who would be reimbursing for a, whatever diagnostic procedures um, we, can, we can come up with for early detection. How do we get there? We have two speakers in the afternoon. Um, they will talk about how we need to compete against the problem. Now, I have some remarks here for the scientists. Oftentimes in science, we compete against each other for funding, you know, for being the first one to get the publication. A and that's, th I understand that. That's what we have to do. That's the world we live in. But in this situation, I want us to refocus and compete against the problem. We need collaborative studies so that our protocols and the data that, that, that come from our studies reinforce themselves so that we can pool data across studies for improved statistical power. We need the data to be cohesive and we need it to be actionable. Actionable. So policy makers can uh, make better decisions and clinicians can make better decisions. And our goal is going to be improved clinical outcomes. We'll get there if we can establish teamwork. And Stephanie um, Smith-Rowe after lunch is going to be talking about establishing communities of practice, groups of collaborative scientists that can come together around uh, you know, specific problems. So this is what you're going to hear today. You've already heard sizing up the problem. I gave you the little paradigm there, hazard ID, exposure assessment, dose response assessment, um, risk characterization. We'll have a two, uh, uh, three talks here on doses or exposures and what we can do to understand moving ourselves from left, from right to left. We'll have three talks on responses. How can we go from top to bottom? We'll come back after lunch, um, and we'll talk about where we go from here. Are there questions? Yes. I agree that, that scientists do cooperate, but what, what, I, what I don't want to see happen is a scientist in one part of the world doing something, a scientist in another part of the world doing something similar, but they generate data sets which are different enough that the data can't be pooled, we can't achieve the statistical power we need if we can talk to one another and we can synergize with one another and come up with common protocols um, so that the studies can reinforce each other better than what they do today. And then your comment on, on you know, 
fostering collaboration among different sectors we can we can explore that further in the afternoon we'll have some breakout sessions for that Well, uh, I'm not saying not to shower, <laughs> okay? Showering within the hour, if that's the best we can do, then let's do that. Um, you know, my mama taught me to wash my hands. I mean, so I've washed my hands. Uh, there was no science behind that. It was mama said. Um, if there are policies, we do the best we can, but as scientists, we need to recognize where policies may have gaps, and what can we do to fill those gaps? Okay, that's my point. I saw another hand. Yes, ma'am. Right, so, so instantaneous exposure occurs, like if I'm administering a drug IV, a bolus IV, you know, bolus push. Um, oral, even though it's, you know, I drink the tablet, there's, a, there's an absorption phase. That's not instantaneous. Dermal also is a little bit blurred out. So what we have to do is we have to make some assumptions, and we, we, we choose a point from which we're going to measure our data but it would be helpful if we're trying to compare data sets across different studies if there was a common understanding of, of what time zero was going to be. I saw a hand over, yes ma'am. Blodgett Street fire. The Blodgett Street. The, what year was the the fire in Texas? The Blodgett Street fire was in 2016. If you want to see it in motion, it's on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for your kind words. David. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, there's a term we use in, in drug development called an outcomes trial. 
outcomes trials are very long, very lengthy. You have to wait for an event which may take years. Um, so, uh, so if we can get biomarker studies, you you can get in way early. It, it's the it's the equivalent of the smoke detector. It's a smoke detector. Yes, ma'am. And I'm not saying don't shower within an hour. Don't. And, and thank you for that. And, and we're going to, uh, I just want to respond. The, the um, last talk of the day, Stephanie will be talking about applying a broader public health perspective to this. We've all had our NIMS training, right? As for the, fire, the, the firefighters in the room. Remember NIMS, how exciting that was? Um, Stephanie will talk about how to take the, the toxicology risk assessment paradigm, which is four steps, and expand it out. Just like we do in NIMS, as the incident escalates, you know, we, we, we escalate the size of the incident management team. We have more boxes that we have to fill. So Stephanie will um, be talking about how to, how to do that. Yes, ma'am. Agreed, and, and, and you're, you're, you're spot on. Just getting a biomarker approved by FDA takes a staggering amount of work. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's an enormous process. Um, so we're, we would be trying to influence, you know, clinical practice. You don't need FDA approval for that. Um, but you're, if you're trying to influence the payers to reimburse, you need a pretty robust data set for that. And I saw an another hand. Okay, yes, sir. Obviously, if, if we can identify other people that we can bring in that can support us in our endeavor, um, we, we should consider that. It would take a pretty effective communication plan and public outreach. 
Um, maybe that's something we can explore in our breakout sessions this afternoon. Mm -hmm.